let's see, um, the plan for today, uh, at least for uh, the next 90 minutes, is sort of divided in three parts. We're going to talk a little bit about the solution for the homework exercise uh, that we handed out and that we started in the last, uh, yesterday's lecture. Um, then we're going to actually, talk, you know, so far, if you noticed, you know, we haven't talked about failures at all and crashes. So the next step is actually introduce you to our failure and crash sort of uh, infrastructure, uh, how to reason about them. And then uh, we'll jump into the remap disk, uh, which will probably keep you as busy for basically the rest of the week uh, for uh, uh, the replicated disk, uh, which will keep us busy for the rest of the, uh, the couple days. Um, now, I'm going to walk through the solution. So uh, I, you know, if you have any questions or things that are, you, know, you didn't understand, you know, this would be a great time to be very interactive and uh, you know, help everybody understand uh, what we're doing. Um, I'm going to start off, you know, sort of reminding you a little bit about like, you know, what the problem was and how actually everything fits together. Um, and then uh, we'll dive into uh, a little bit of the cock code. And so at the, correct, so the, the proof style that we're following uh, in uh, these labs is in one of refinement. And so there's two layers involved, you know, the spec layer, uh, which starts in some state, right? So here's the spec layer. And I actually have the spec layer basically uh, up here on the, on the screen. And we'll see that actually the, the three transitions that are possible at the top level in the spec layer, namely a read, a write, or a size operation, right? if you look in the step operations. Um, and so there's, and there's some state at the spec level. And the state at the spec level is a, a disk. And we'll look at it as a second what a disk is. But you, know, you can think about it as there's an you know, array of disk blocks you know, going from 0 to some size where, you know, this kind of size is going to be s minus 1, OK? And so there are three ways, you know, there are three transitions possible out of that particular state. You know, either a read that returns a value, a write, you know, that updates the disk, or I guess the size that returns the size of the disk. And that gets us into a new state. And for example, if we do a write, you know, that might actually update some block. Okay, so that's the top level spec, and that's sort of saying that this is what is correct. And, um, and then we have to implement that. Right? And so that's the next layer down. There's the code level, uh, which we're going to be looking at. And in fact, one of the functions you, know, you have to implement. Um, and the state at the code level uh, is also a disk. Uh, but that disk is a little bit bigger. In fact, there's one bigger than the one uh, on the spec level. So we're going to look at that in a second. And the second piece of the state is a bad sector. I think it was mostly called BS. Um, and, and that's a single number. Right? It's an index that corresponds to the sector that actually is bad, you know, so maybe two. And so there's only one bad sector in this particular disk, you know, just to make things you know, simple to think about. All right, and then. You know, there, on the code level, there's a, different, a number of ways of also making transitions. Uh, and that is based on, you know, a bad sector API disk, which we'll look at in a sec second. But it has operations, you know, smaller operations where it reads and writes, you know, to different uh, sectors. And so, you know, when we're going to implement one of these functions, say read, you know, we're going to go through a couple intermediate states, end up in some you know, hopefully final state of our implementation. Uh, and that's going to produce, you know, some new uh, disk, you know, where we may have updated. You know, for example, if we implement right, you know, we might have either updated the uh, a sector that is not the bad sector, or if it was the bad sector, we'll have updated the last, you know, sector, right? And so we're going to get a new state where maybe, you know, either if they're mapped directly, you know, the uh, a block is updated. And now what we need to do, correct, and what we need to show is that there is you know, some abstraction relationship between you know, the code states and the spec states. Correct? And in, when we initially start out, when we init the system, you know, we have to prove that that you know, relation holds. Then if we, for any operation that we're doing here and for any corresponding implementation, we have to show that the final state, you know, that uh, relationship also holds. One of the goals was actually one of the tasks was actually figuring out what that abstraction function is uh, for this particular assignment. Right? So there's a couple of things that we need to do. 
we need to look at actually how to implement read and write in terms of these you know, lower level bad sector implementations, and we need to figure out what this abstraction function is. All right. Okay, so you know, before diving a little bit further in, let's sort of think a little bit about the abstraction function. Okay, so we're on, we have a, uh, a spec disk, I think it's often S in the context of, I think so it has some size, uh, divided up in blocks, let's say the four of them. And then we have a real disk, of V, and it's one block bigger than the spec disk. And uh, the real disk, you know, the, the spec disk doesn't have any bad sectors. But the real desk you know, does have a bad sector. And so again, if the bad sector is, let's say, I'll add two, then if we do a write to two, correct? So if this sector is bad, unusable, and we write to this particular block, what we're going to do is actually we're going to implement the last block of the sector. So this is going to correspond to the contents of you know, what is two on the level of the spec disk. Make sense? And so you can immediately see there's some relationships that might halt correct, between S and D, which is going to be part of our abstraction function. One, you know, this disk must be at least one larger than uh, the spec disk. Uh, you know, it'd be nice if the bad sector you know, is actually you know, within the bounds you know, of the real disk. Right? That's probably probably you know, we need to uh, think about. And then there's a little bit of a, you know, this bad sector, you know, I drew it nicely in the middle as being two. Uh, but, you know, it's actually not constrained, right? And so we need to figure out, like, what happens if the bad sector actually is the last sector, actually the one that actually we're using, you know, as a replacement value for the bad sector, right? So there's going to be a couple corner cases that we need to think about. We also need to think about if we're going to write, for example, if on S we're going to read, you know, we're going to pass in the argument of the bad sector that happens to be past, you know, the real disk, you know, what, what actually happens? Uh, we've got to make sure that we don't do anything bad. And particularly in the case of write, you know, we don't really want to overwrite actually the bad sector. That may be the, you know, the shadow thing for actually the real bad sector. Right? So there are a couple of cases that we need to sort of think about. Okay, good. So the first thing maybe to do uh, is to take a quick look at actually what a disk is. Um, uh, just to... Uh, 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 to make that concrete, uh, and it is a basically sort of a standard, you know, sort of cock, you know, trick. It's an uninterpreted function, uh, a memory function that actually has a domain, a maximum size, right? And so we can look at uh, here's what it says. You know, basically says the, the nat of the size, and then it actually is a memory. Uh, and just to you know look at one uh, function, here's the uh, when we do an upd on the disk, correct? Here's upd. Here's a memory, here's an address, here's a value. And what update produ produces actually is a new function uh, where uh, we check that if, in that function, if the uh, address is equal to the address being updated, then we return the new value. Otherwise, we return, return what the previous value of the interpreter function is. Right? So sort of a standard you know, uh, implementation uh, using uninterpreted functions. And there's mo almost nothing else you know, to the disk. And there's a whole bunch of lemmas you know, about like if you do two updates to the same address, you know, then you know, the value is overwritten, uh, you know, the different addresses, then, the, you know, whatever, et cetera. You can imagine all what is going on. Okay, good. So back to the remapped uh, disk. This was our top-level API, and we now we need to implement that, that top-level uh, API. Um, and so let's look at the uh, uh, implementation. Okay, so first, you know, before looking at the implementation, uh, let's look at the, quickly at where, what the uh, bottom level is. So the API of the bad sector disk, which is what we're going to be using to implement you know, the top level API. Right? And the bad sector disk has six possible steps. Uh, and we'll see that showing up uh, in a second. We have the regular read, uh, where if the address is, equal, is not equal to the bad sector, we'll just read the block, correct? Right? So this corresponds to the case that, for example, we're reading block one, we just go read them block one. So we can take that step. Uh, the second case is we're actually reading out of bound. And so we're reading a value, we're trying to read uh, a block that is actually beyond the size of the disk, and in that case we're going to return none, right? So then the read will return none. 
And this comes out of our definition of actually the, the generic disk. And then uh, there's a third step operation, which is for the case that we're reading actually the bad sector. And in the case of the bad sector, uh, we're going to read the bad sector. Uh, but you will see that the R value, the return values, is not constrained. Right? So we're reading from the actual bad sector. So for example, if we were to do a read of sector 2, which is the bad sector, the R you know, can be any value. And so there's nothing really we can prove anything with it. Right? And so that's the three steps we can do. And then there's the, you know, steps for the corresponding other operations. There's a write step. Nothing really that exciting about it. And there is the getting actually the uh, bad sector. And there's the size operation. OK? Good. Question? Yeah? So one thing I found surprising about that definition was that it doesn't do anything special for writing the bad Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, in fact, write doesn't do anything bad either for writing outside of the disk. Right? It just produces some value and returns TT. Yeah, you could have de defined it differently. You know, the, basically, the way we t chose the top-level spec, you know, you'll see that actually in the remap disk API, uh, write is also unconstrained. You, know, you can actually write behind beyond the end of the disk, and it actually doesn't return uh, an error. Okay? So there's multiple ways sort of fixing you know, making the semantics more precise, uh, but, you know, we tried to keep it as simple as possible so that you didn't have to deal with another write case. Uh, okay, um, so let's uh, look at things a little bit. Um, so the first thing to think about is, uh, let's little bit first do write, uh, so that actually makes us think a little bit about, you know, how to update the real disk. Uh, and here's, you know, you know our solution. Uh, uh, basically, what we do is, uh, and this comes back to the question you, know, you just asked, you know, first we look at the size of the real disk. And if we're writing to, if, you know, the implementation actually wants to write, you know, to, that, you know the end, to, the, to the end of the disk, we don't want to do that, correct? Because that's where our copy of the, you know, where is the replacement of the bad sector is. And we certainly don't want to overwrite it. And so if that's the case, we basically uh, return TT, but we don't do anything, right? which is very similar to, you know, their, uh, uh, which is allowed by the top-level spec. Um, then uh, if the, uh, the next case is, you know, we're going to actually read, you know, the bad sector number. Uh, if the address is equal to the bad sector number, we'll update the last block. So this corresponds to the case that we're actually updating two, and so we're not going to update the bad sector, but we're going to update actually the last uh, block of the disk. And then uh, there's the final case, uh, which is the normal case, that if the block number is not equal to the uh, bad sector, then we can just update that block directly. So those are the cases. Uh, and then we read, we walked through yesterday, and so basically our only job left is actually to prove that read and write, you know, implement, you know, faithfully, you know, the top level spec. Right? And as you can see, uh, yeah, I don't know how many people did this wrong, but for example, if you forget, you know, the you know disk check, uh, you might actually run very serious problems in your proof. Right? So verification actually should help us, you know, catching the cases where you know, we might have forgotten something in the implementation. Uh, certainly, we actually I uh, forgot, you know, to put this initial check into the right, and was not able to prove uh, the final specification. Okay, so uh, so let's look at the. Uh, we ask you to think about the remap abstraction. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, uh, at least I find it surprisingly, uh, it's actually pretty subtle uh, to come up with uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the abstraction relationship. Um, I don't know how many people, anybody got it right in the first attempt to prove this? No, good, I think it's no, no. So, okay, so I assume, how many people actually were able to complete the read proof? Just out of curiosity. One, two, three. Okay, small number of people. Okay, well, I'm going to walk through this slowly, uh, and hopefully to you know, help you get going, and then you maybe can go back. Um, so there are a couple cases, uh, uh, and the hints basically hint in every case uh, to help you get along. Uh, so let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, actually. So uh, there are three cases. If the sector is good, uh, then uh, you know, the values of the 
real disk and the spec disk or the replicated disk and the uh, uh, retrieval just equal. Uh, if uh, we're uh, if we're ha actually uh, if we're talking about the sector that's being remapped, uh, then the value of the spec disk, you know, for say entry T two should be equal to the last uh, disk block of the real disk. Um, and then you know there's another constraint that actually the uh, bad sector actually is within the size of the bad sector disk, you know the code disk, okay? Uh, and then the final constraint which, you know, we gave you, which is that actually the bad sector disk is one bigger than the real disk, uh, than the spec disk, sorry. Okay, so that's the abstraction function. And so uh, let's look at how to prove something. Uh, so, and so the, the, the plan is you know, pretty straightforward. I mean, basically, we have a whole bunch of tactics that are sort of like magic uh, that basically move you through you know, the state diagram. Um, and in particular, uh, you know, we break it up in a number of cases, correct, for one for each operation, and we're going to look at the implementation for read. Um, and so that's the first case that we're going to be looking at. And, you know, we forget the lift world Oops. Uh, case. Uh, and the next step is, okay, let me see, I can show a little bit of the proof state. Uh, that's not so interesting yet. Uh, so this basically puts us at the beginning, and then we're going to actually use, you know, what we're going to, I guess, call here uh, proc spec symbolic execution to basically sort of symbolically execute the implementation code, and that's going to produce a whole list, you know, of possible uh, uh, end states for the operation. And for every end state of the operation, we need to prove that the abstraction function holds. Uh, and now, in this case, uh, because it's read, uh, it's going to actually produce quite a number of uh, end states. And in fact, we can you know, see that right away. Uh, we're actually going to get six sub goals, right, where for each one of them, they correspond to a possible new state on the code level. And for every code state, we have to prove that it actually maintains, you know, there is a corresponding uh, spec state for which the abstraction function holds. And so the first thing to wonder is, like, why six? You know, that seems a lot for a read operation, correct? How it's possible? And the, the answer is, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, first of all, the read function had one if statement in there, correct? So, like, when doing symbolic execution, then we're going to go down both branches. Uh, but in addition, the uh, low-level operation, the bad sector read, which we're presumably we're, we're going to be executing in that, in, that, uh, in that particular piece of code, actually has three possible ways of actually doing a, a transition, right? Whether it's an out-of-bound, a regular one, or a bad sector one. So we get like two times three uh, possible execution traces. And so for each one, we need to go through, you know, understand like what case it is, and then, you know, proofing. So let's uh, look at the first one. Uh, so solve so final state just breaks things down a bit, and uh, we're now going to be in a case where we need to prove that you know the real disk, the spec disk, either returns a value or returns none, right? Where none is if it actually is out of bounds, and uh, we're given you know some information in our context, um, uh, and you know basically that there was a valid remap di remap disk extraction was holding. And then some new things actually are true. So let's actually invert the abstraction so we can see uh, what's going on. Uh, and uh, we're seeing that this is the, 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 the first case that we're going to be dealing with, which is actually the address that we're reading is equal to the uh, uh, remapped or the, the bad, so bad, bad sector disk. If you remember from read, that's the first thing that actually we did uh, check. Um, and so, uh, and we see also that the, in here in the uh, context, we have a basically a broken down version of our abstraction function, uh, nicely labeled with uh, names so that we can actually talk about the different pieces. Um, and we also know that we're in the real disk, we're actually reading, you know, we have actually read some value, you know, V, right? And we know this, this corresponds that we're reading actually uh, sector two, and so we're going to be returning uh, the bad, se you know, the, the replacement uh, sector. And we have to prove that the uh, function, actually, the abstraction function holds, right? Does this all make sense? Okay, good. 
Uh, and so, you know, this is now, for now, basically, we're sort of in cock manipulation mode, uh, where we just need to push some symbols back and forth. Uh, because basically, we have the information here, right? I mean, this, this, this is the thing, the V, that we want to return, but we can't return it always. Or it's not always true, so let's uh, walk down a little bit. Uh, so first, we'll rewrite some stuff, and then we're in a new uh, situation. Um, uh, and we need to sort of, uh, let me double check here. Yeah, so now we're in the situation where we've rewritten uh, the, uh, we're basically using size s, which is the last, you know, corresponds to the, the block number of the last sector. And we need to, uh, uh, and we know that actually that returned, that has some value. So we're going to destruct that value so that we can look at the two cases. So we're going to destruct with a v0, the bad sector is equal to the size of s, which you know, should be the case. If it is not, then uh, we're going to take the right branch. And basically, you know, uh, basically that means that's an out-of-bound sector. Uh, we're out-of-bound disk right at the level of the spec. Correct? And so in that case, it must be the case that uh, we have to go right uh, because we're reading beyond to the end of the disk. And then uh, there's only one way you know, for SV0 to be non to be true. That's only when V0 is actually outside of the disk. So we apply the lemma outside of the disk. And that requires us to prove that V0 is not smaller than the size of S. And that turns out you know, we basically have E here that says that V0 was equal to the size of S. And so uh, omega is going to be able to solve this solution. So, boom, we're done with you know that uh, side of it. So then, there's the other side where you know the disk, the, re the sector that we're reading is actually not equal to the last uh, to the size of s. And so this is a valid you know bad sector read, if you will. And uh, we need to go left, right, because we're going to prove that uh, there's actually the values uh, that we're going to return v. And now we have all the information in our context, you know, the D size of is some V. So we can just re rewrite using uh, a dream map and you know, basically solves that particular goal. Okay? So that's one of the six uh, read cases, you know, solved. Does that make everybody sort of understand what went on there? Okay, good. Uh, so we're done with well, that one case. I'm not going to really walk through all the other cases of read, but they're basically all similar, correct? They're all basically boiling down to you know, reasoning about whether the BS, the back sector, is equal to this or not, uh, whether the address that we're reading from actually is beyond the spec disk, and you know, go for all these different cases. And basically, there are either contradictions or you know, there's going to be something that Omega, in the end, is going to be able to solve for us. Um, OK. So the other thing we ask you to do uh, is implement write. Uh, so let's look at write a little bit again, uh, just to remind you uh, how that looked. Um, OK, so uh, here again, uh, you have to familiarize you. So what the first thing to do is actually check that we're not re yeah, go ahead. Uh, could you take out the, the bounds check the first time you go through the proof and see how it fails? Uh, the, the destruct case? The uh, well, you said A equals min minus one return, return, return. Two, three. Yeah. Yeah. Could you kick that out and see how the thing fails in the Uh Okay, that would be quite a big, maybe we can do that in the uh, after, uh, because that's going to, you know. <laughs> Take us a couple minutes to walk through and see where it all breaks. Okay. Um, yeah. So you know, this is sort of the instant case, correct? When our, the 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 caller or on the spec level, we're trying to write beyond the end of the disk. On the spec on the code level, that actually sector does exist. So we want to make sure that we have a runtime check that we're actually not overwriting it. Um, and then basically the story on the the rest of the write is very similar to uh, the read case. You know we actually look if it's the bad sector, if it's the bad sector, read you know write the final block. If it's not the bad sector, read the regular uh, block. Okay. So let's uh, walk through uh, to the write case. You know these are all the read cases. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. And so we get to write, which is here. Um, and 
Uh, again, it's going to be sort of a similar story. First, we're going to lift the world. So we're going to do sort of these magic uh, um, tactics that will actually get us in the position that we need to reason about uh, the final uh, code level states uh, that are being produced. And uh, we need to find a corresponding uh, top you know, spec state uh, and then show that the abstraction function holds. Uh, so and was, in this case, uh, you know, as we look, we're going to have three sub goals, uh, all corresponding to one of the three cases that Wright could actually end up with. And you know, remember, uh, Wright has two if statements, and it's going to produce three. Uh, the symbolic execution is basically going to be produce three possible uh, code states. And for each code state, we're going to go and prove it. So let's look at one of them. Question. Yeah. Uh, the remapped abstraction is the abstraction function. So hold on, we're going to unfold it in a second. So we're going to just solve the update, and then here's your remapped abstraction, correct? So this, if we look at this context, you know, we know for the initial states, the remapped abstraction, the, this abstraction function holds, and now we need to prove that actually it holds for the final. Uh, we need to construct a state, and we need, we need to prove that for that final state, that remapped abstraction uh, holds. Um, and what we're seeing here, uh, so let me see what case this is. Um, uh, doom. Ah, this is the case where we're actually trying to write, you know, to the final disk, uh, to the final sector, which we should just not allow. Uh, and so, uh, we're, and in fact, our uh, implementation didn't do any updates, and uh, so we'll rewrite using uh, that we actually didn't do any updates. And now we just need to prove that none is true uh, for this sector. And we know this is true for the initial state. We didn't update the state, so presumably it's going to be true in the new state that we have too. And so we can invert the abstraction function, uh, then apply the fact that we're writing out of bounds. Uh, and so now we have to prove that d minus 1 is not smaller than the size of disk, you know, basically proving that the block number that we're writing to is not a valid block number to write to. And we have, in our context, uh, enough information to do that if we look here at 8 size. And again, omega can just solve that case. Okay? Yeah? Exactly. And then leading up to the sub -goal yeah, the yeah, path. yeah. So you could have done everything by hand, sort of doing stepping, you know, through. Basically, what we're doing, we're running the program in a symbolic fa fashion. Correct? We're executing the right implementation, and the right implementation has a, a bunch of bad sector operations and some if statements. And for, for every, if on sorry, yeah. If you, we could have longer ones, but then we have loop invariants that you know will prove. Uh, and so, in fact, you know, if Nikolai will talk about this in a second. Uh, you, you clearly can see, even in the read case, correct, we had six uh, K symbolic states out of the symbolic execution. And so, for like big programs or programs that have loops, uh, that seems not a great situation to be in. And so, in fact, you know, we're going to introduce some, a little bit more mechanism, uh, you know, sort of proof engineering mechanism uh, that will allow us to basically collapse a lot of these symbolic execution cases into one. Uh, state, so that we don't have to argue about all six independently, because many of them are basically identical. Uh, and so, in fact, uh, there's going to be some more machinery in, you know, five minutes that will help deal with that. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I don't know if this is the direction that you're planning to go, but it occurs to me as you, as you present this that the mapping of having exactly one and at the end and so forth is very specialized, and that from a slightly more abstract point of view, you can have an arbitrary number uh, at the spec level, an arbitrary number as long mm -hmm. as it's more, and, you, and, and then you have some very straightforward constraints that have <coughs> one one and the bad sectors not included, yeah. um, and then some of the machinery of uh, less than one and so forth is uh, submerged underneath that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, the, the, I'm not sure exactly what the question uh, well, is. So, so I guess the question is, uh, might it help to actually be slightly more abstract and more general? about what that mapping is and, and be able to handle more cases 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think, uh, yeah, so, so, so first of all, you know, th this, this assignment was mostly to sort of warm up, you know, for, you know, getting more, uh, familiar with the infrastructure, uh, and two, with the sort of the way we do uh, backward simulation proofs, right? And so, in particular, you know, this whole story of, you know, we execute forward, and then, you know, we need to solve these states. And so, and that part of the infrastructure is actually very general. So, this, uh, you can think about the... Uh, refinement infrastructure as a very gener generic refinement infrastructure, nothing really special about it. Uh, for the abstraction function, you know, that actually is always the challenge in these refinement proofs. Uh, and that's where sort of the meat is. Um, and, and you can see that even for the simple case, uh, this abstraction function is actually quite tricky, you know, to write down. Uh, in the sense that if you forget one piece of it, you know, actually proof will not go through. And uh, of course, by the time you're in the proof, you know, you're trying to look at your context and trying to figure out, ah, you know, can I, you know, line things up that actually everything works out, but really what turns out the case, you know, and you're not able to do it, and really what is the problem is not something like you're using the wrong tactic or, you know, not observing something in context. You just have the wrong abstraction function, and you have to go back and figure out what that is. Um, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with this, where, like, this feeling where you're reasoning on the long level of abstraction to try to figure out what you're trying to prove and that you're actually just down the wrong path. Uh, okay, um, so, so that was sort of the boring case. Uh, let's look at one more case, you know, which is actually we're writing to the bad sector. Uh, and so what I mean, that, what, what, this is going to be very similar to the read case, correct, where we're going to be writing, uh, so the case that we're going to consider is uh, we're writing to the spec uh, block two, and on the code disk, you know, we actually have to write over here, correct? And, and so presumably what we're going to be doing is constructing some state uh, on the uh, spec level that says, yeah, the, the, that write is reflected, and uh, it's reflected at that address that we're writing to. So we're inverting the instruction, nothing really special going on. Um, and we basically have to prove that uh, we have a new spec state, correct, where V1, the bad sector of V1, has been updated, and we need to prove that our code uh, state corresponds you know, to that particular uh, you know, spec state, right? And where the spec state is the update to that particular block. And so that follows basically very similar, you know, this proof is basically identical to the read case. You know, we rewrite some sizes and then, um, now let me see, show you where we are then. Uh, and then we have basically uh, uh, a couple cases, you know, obligations that we need to prove because of the uh, ref uh, because of the abstraction function, and we need to prove that you know the disk up D of size D on the real disk is equal to the disk up D on the spec disk at address V1. And if we look in our context, you know we have all kinds of useful information like H size uh, in this H remap you know, to actually uh, be able to prove that. And and so there are going to be two cases uh, where. Um, uh, a is equal to is not equal to size of S, and A is not equal to V1, and you know basically uh, for these two cases we need to uh, prove through. So the first case, uh, A is not equal to V1, uh, and the size or A is not equal to V1, and A, A is not equal to the size. That means that basically this disk of D is nothing. You know it doesn't really do anything uh, because uh, we're uh, that's not the address that we're updating, and so we have a you know, lemma for that that basically says if you're updating a block, that, you're reading a block that is not being updated, then you're actually reading the old value. And there's nothing uh, special about it. And that, you know, gives us uh, this result and then auto can just solve this. And so then the next case is actually we are reading the block that we updated and that has uh, basically the same uh, structure except in this case uh, V1, correct, we're reading V1 and we had just updated V1, so we know that this read of V1 should return B, correct? And so we're applying uh, this read of the equal lemma, and actually will solve the whole thing for us. Okay, does that all make sense? Um, okay, so uh, you know the other right cases are very similar in uh, nature. You know that it is uh, uh, sort of the same. Uh, procedure, but you know, in every case, there's you know something that's slightly different, uh, you know, in the state where you ended up with, and you have to just prove that the remap function actually, uh, the abstraction function actually holds. So, the only other uh, thing that we ask you to uh, look at um, 
was in it, uh, which actually is a bit, hold on, let me get to the right point. Uh, boom, 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 um, and that's here. Uh, and uh, I don't know how many people uh, were able to prove in it. I imagine not that many. Uh, it was more sort of posted there as a challenge exercise if you really had nothing else to do. Um, uh, but let me uh, uh, tell you, so I'm going to walk through you know, the cock, you know, whatever uh, tactics to actually get to you there. But the challenge here, correct, is that um, at the beginning of time, uh, we need to, you know, we have some code disk that we start off with that we initialize. You know, we have some bad sector and it has some size. And um, we need to construct a sort of a, we need to prove that there is an initial state, you know, at the spec level for which the abstraction function holds. So we need to construct that disk. And we're given basically only the spec, the code disk that we actually initialized. And so the tricky part here is that, uh, and this is what a bunch of dilemmas deal with, is that we need to take this disk and shrink it by one. And, you know, basically show that, you know, for the shrink disk, you know, all the values you know, map out correctly in the abstraction function holds. Uh, and so there's a couple interesting uh, tricky cases in, in it. You know, let me uh, go all the way up to the implementation of init uh, to just see that. Uh, this is, here's init. Um, and in fact, you know, if you can see, uh, initialization can actually fail. Uh, and this is crucial, correct? Because, you know, there's for certain disk, you know, we should not be able to prove anything uh, about the system. And for example, one case that we can, uh, that you should not be able to deal with anything with if the real disk uh, is uh, length zero, there is no room for a bad sector, right? And so that case should be excluded and it should be not possible. And, you know, if you forget this, you know, some of your proofs, you know, you will actually not be able to prove the, uh, 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 that actually you have a correct initialization. And similarly, you know, there is a case where, uh, the bad sector is bigger than the size of the real disk or the code disk. And for that, of course, you know, there's no way you can construct a spec state that actually uh, also holds. And, and so that's, you know, how Innis, you know, fits into the uh, complete story. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay, good. So, so far we have not talked about failures at all. And so our next step, you know, we basically have disks, you know, that are except for the bad sector, uh, you know, but we haven't really talked about uh, uh, crashes or, you know, complete disks going away. And so what we're going to do next is, you know, take this sort of same infrastructure and make it slightly more sophisticated so that we can talk about replicated disks. And so where we have the spec disk be implemented, represented by two physical disks, so that if one of the two fails, you know, we can still keep on running, right? That's what we saw in the demo that Nikolai uh, showed yesterday. All right, so Nikolai is going to take it from here and introduce you to the additional machinery and the next assignment. So there's a couple of things I wanted to uh, show you guys. Um, so first off, before we dive into the next phase of this replication of the disk, I wanted to connect the dots with uh, how the re remap disk that Franz walked through and you guys worked on actually fits in a bigger picture. Like, how do we actually get a running system out of this snippet of cock code that you guys implemented and proved things about? So I want to a little bit put the cock code in context and show you how uh, in our prototype we go from proven cock code to a runnable executable and how it clicks into other system components. So to give you a little bit of a sense of the overall um, system diagram here, uh, let me draw a picture for you. So the most immediate thing that uh, we're going to be producing is this program called um, remap nbd 
And uh, this is the executable that we're compiling with Haskell that includes in it uh, the code that you were proving correct. And this is going to sit on top of the Linux kernel at the bottom that is going to run this program. Um, and Linux is going to be actually providing to us the disk with a bad sector in it. We're modeling it as a file, but it um, could be a real disk in principle. And uh, Linux also is going to talk to our remapped NBD implementation to access our virtual remapped fixed up disk. And it does so through this NBD protocol. So there's a program called NBD client running on top of Linux whose job is to take requests from the Linux kernel and forward them on to our remap NBD process. So what happens is that in the remap NBD process, uh, there's a pair of queues. One queue that buffers up requests coming in from the Linux kernel to read or write sectors, and another queue that sends responses back to the Linux kernel through this NBD client. And inside of here are, of course, the several pieces that you guys just looked at. So there's going to be an implementation of read. This is the fixed up remapped read, and an implementation of write somewhere in there. And there's going to be an implementation of bad read and bad write. These are the low level operations. And somewhere in there, there's also the get size operation, get bad sector, et cetera. And the read calls the bad read, and the write calls the bad write. And the way we're going to actually fit it all together is that there's actually going to be a server loop, if you will, um, called, in fact, server loop, whose job is to take requests out of this queue and run the appropriate operation. And after the appropriate operation completes and returns something, it's going to send a response back out through this NBD queue to the Linux kernel. So now I want to sort of show you a little bit of the code pieces that go into this. You already saw the cock implementations of read and write here. So maybe I'll use this only other color I have, the yellow, to draw out the pieces that we actually have uh, implemented in cock. So yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah, good point. Yeah, I should really have drawn these guys. Yeah, the bad read and the bad write. Uh, is that what you meant, I hope? Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah, sorry, I had them, forgot to draw. Um, yeah, the, these guys, uh, the implementations of these in Haskell must talk to the Linux kernel to actually access this disk. Good. Thanks, thanks for catching that. Um, so these guys, the read, chunk keeps breaking, man. The read and the write are implemented in cock, and you guys proved things about them. Um, but the server loop turns out to also be a piece of cock code that we can uh, look at. So the remap disk server uh, is right here. And uh, you can actually look at its implementation. Um, it is right here. It uh, runs recovery first, which uh, we haven't talked about much yet. Uh, but then it runs this handling loop, which basically gets a request, which implements that arrow getting a request from the queue. And then it considers what is this request. And this looks at the NBD request itself. So it could be a read, in which case it performs a read opcode and uh, runs the read and then sends a response back out the NBD queue, which makes its way out to the Linux kernel. Or it could be a write, which is going to call your proven write implementation, etc. And um, maybe the next thing we can actually look at uh, is um, so, so this is the cock implementation of the server loop. So this actually is cock code. We haven't actually proven any theorem about it. It's just implemented in cock, so it's easy to see what's going on. We can also look at the bottom pieces there, the bad read and the bad write. Where do those come from? These actually come from uh, basically stubs. They are not implemented in cock itself, but we state them as axioms. So this axiom definition tells cock, assume there's something called HS read which, given an address, will give you a program for getting a block out of it. And we basically construct an implementation of the bad sector uh, API using these axiomatized program snippets. And then, at the very bottom of this file, what we do is we tell it that when extracting to Haskell, use this string to represent this supposedly 
axiomatized function. So this basically uh, tells Koch that these things don't, well, uh, exist somewhere, but you can't reason about them in Koch. There's no Galenian representation for them. But when we go to produce the Haskell code, we'll just reference this ASCII string, and hopefully the Haskell code will exist there somewhere. Does this make some sense? Yeah. Yeah, the cofix point is basically we want to go into an infinite loop. Um, so uh, Benjamin is referring to the server loop being defined as a cofix point. The reason for that is that uh, we want to keep handling requests. So uh, after we get a request and service it and send a response, we call the same handling loop again. And we want to keep processing as many requests as there are. If you don't define it as a cofix point and you try to define it as a regular fixed point, Koch will rightly or not uh, tell you that this is a uh, non-terminating expression and, uh, this, uh, and will not let you define it without some trickery. Uh, using, uh, defining it as a cofix point allows us to basically have infinite loops in our expressions and allows us to generate infinite looping Haskell code that will keep servicing requests fairly intuitively the way I've written it down here. Question. So I know that cofix points normally have like uh, some requirements on the fact that they are productive. So yeah. So this uh, this semicolon is the productivity. Uh, yeah. <laughs> For a technical question, here's the technical answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you had another question. Yeah, so basically the semicolon is a bind constructor of this cofix point, so it is productive. It never goes into an infinitely non-productive loop. Yeah. Um, I noticed this program, uh, the cofix point, is the outer loop of the whole program? Uh, yeah, there's basically this little server loop at the bottom that says first you recover, which we'll talk about tomorrow, uh, and then you actually run this infinite loop servicing requests. In fact, here's a case where it's uh, not this pattern. Uh, in fact, you, you have to actually do something special first to set things up, and then you enter the, the infinite loop. Uh, so I don't know. A, of course, you could structure anything as an infinite loop at the top level with just appropriate state to help you bootstrap and only the first time. Um, we haven't, well, I should say, we have never proven an interesting theorem so far about these cofix points. The only reason we're writing them in Koch is that so it is easy to see how the pieces fit together without having to shell out to Haskell where it's a different syntax and a different world. Uh, all the theorems that we've uh, been proving are about uh, non-coinductive programs uh, that are finite and the infinite loops um, are mostly there for code generation, not for proving a property about some state machine correspondence between them. Make sense? Other questions here? Yeah. The, another cofix point I want just to confirm. So those extract binds in both Haskell and OCaml. Yes. Um, exactly what you expect. Yeah, they uh, pretty much uh, do what you expect. So we can actually look at uh, these extracted pieces now. Uh, so let me show you guys. Uh, first off, I want to sort of uh, maybe come back to this bad sector disk just to show you, show you how these axioms extract out and how they work out. Um, so we were uh, ac presuming that there's something in Haskell that's going to implement these axiomatized bad read and bad write at the bottom of the diagram. And in Haskell, we actually implement them in uh, this file, uh, source uh, bad sector disk ops. Um, so here are the implementations. Um, here's read, which basically gets a file descriptor, gets the bad sector number. If it's the bad sector, it returns some garbage otherwise actually calls the pread system call to get the data from our simulated disk file in the Linux kernel. This file is not in bad sector disk. This is in remap nbd source slash bad sector disk slash ops hs. Um, there's uh, another SRC directory under remap nbd okay. if you're trying to follow along. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's the stubs that we're implementing in Haskell at the bottom. And the yellow boxes on the, on the board uh, extract to you know, plausible looking Haskell code. Uh, so here's what our implementation of read and write extract to. Um, so here's the read implementation. Um, it's kind of stylized uh, Haskell code. Uh, so here's the semicolon bind operator at the top level. It says, well, first, 
you run the get bed sector operation. And after that, you have a lambda that takes the result, sticks it in a thing called BS, and then uses the equals operator to decide if it's equal to the address of the sector you're reading. If so, does one thing. If not, does another. So it's a kind of a, not, not the kinds of Haskell code you would write by hand, uh, but uh, seems close enough. Um, and uh, Haskell compiles it just fine. And here's an implementation of the write. Uh, uh, also, you can see semicolons appearing as binds, case analysis, return statements, and so on. And the question that uh, you asked uh, earlier, the server code also extracts out. Uh, so here's the infinite loop for the handle case. So handle is just a program in Haskell of the type the prog. This is our constructor um, from prog from cock. Uh, and you can see that uh, inside of it, at the end of each branch handling a request, it calls back to itself the handle function. And this uh, works fine in Haskell's uh, lazy evaluation. Question. We have uh, statements uh, like these guys that basically tell it how to extract uh, our bind to Haskell bind. Uh, this is defined in um, refinement prog extra, extract prog. Uh, here's sort of the statement that says you sort of extract the various constructors of prog to basically an error. You're not allowed to do the first constructor. You can, the second constructor is return, and the third constructor is bind. Um, very syntactic, just sort of three constructors. Here's the ASCII stuff to print out. If you make a mistake here, it'll generate Haskell code that doesn't compile. Uh, yeah. Other questions about this uh, extraction plan so far? Yeah. Uh, because Haskell's type system is not as expressive as uh, Cox. And as a result, when Cock knows something is of the right type, it is not always able to generate Haskell code that type checks. And as a result, it must uh, perform these unsafe courses. This turns out to be, at least in the current implementation of extraction, I think, safe in Haskell. Uh, Yeah, so among uh, other reasons for performance uh, downsides, uh, I think these unsafe courses prevent some optimizations. Yeah. Uh, it's not specific to Haskell. Uh, the object.magic that you would get if you extracted it to OCaml precludes the same kinds of optimizations in uh, OCaml as well. But yeah, that's a good point. It's uh, not, this is definitely not the kind of code that GHC is optimized for, because this is not what you would write by hand or the patterns that the compiler expects out of regular programmers. Make sense? Other questions? So this is the sort of setup that we use to uh, generate uh, running code. And this is how proving this little piece of the puzzle uh, translates into a, a running system. Hopefully. Makes sense? Question in the back. It, well, there's two subtleties. One is that it can cause uh, performance problems when you build up a large chain of, or an expensive lazy computation that gets forced at uh, a later point when it would have been more efficient to just strictly force evaluation as you're running along. On the other hand, so it's a little bit tricky to uh, know when to force strictness. As it turns out, uh, we tried changing the cock extraction to, to, to Haskell to force all the extracted Haskell code to be strict. In Haskell, you can do this by putting the exclamation bang annotation mark to force strictness. It turns out that in Cox's case, the type system sometimes knows that a certain branch basically will not be taken because you can include a proof of false in that branch and you can convince that this is an invalid branch. This is, it should never happen. Um, the, Proofs, the props, like false, get erased when you extract to Haskell. So Haskell sees it and sees, well, this is a valid branch. It's just a match statement. And Cock relies on this laziness to make sure that Haskell never actually evaluates that false branch. If you force everything in Haskell to be strict, 
that false branch will get evaluated by GHC and you will get an evaluation of something that's probably not quite right. Uh, and in fact, it often uh, evaluates uh, some either missing symbol or some error expression that terminates your Haskell program. So it's for this, the type system mismatch unfortunately takes advantage of laziness to some extent in the current implementation of extraction when going to Haskell. Uh, I think it, effectively the same for OCaml, except that it forces it in the form of having these funks that never actually get run uh, in OCaml code. Um, but it is a little bit tricky to generate performant Haskell. We've uh, had to learn a bunch of tricks for that. Uh, Benjamin. Since we got into the Haskell versus OCaml. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so, um, I guess there's uh, two questions here. One is, like in this little world we've constructed for the homework assignment so far, uh, we can actually see it's actually not a whole lot. Um, so the main pieces are uh, the top level application here, which is like 80 lines of code. This is the thing that takes your binary, takes the arguments, runs your code. Um, there's the implementation of the bad sector disk. That's uh, another 100 lines of code, let's say. And then there's the um, the thing that implements the NBD protocol on the right side of the diagram there, I think is a little bit more Haskell code, um, I guess 200 lines plus a uh, library that we borrowed from someone that's another 100 lines. So it's not huge actually, the, the stubs are pretty small uh, if you're careful about uh, taking advantage of existing Haskell libraries like byte strings and integers and so on. Uh, in our bigger project uh, about a verified file system, I think we have a little bit more Haskell code. I can, uh, I guess, pull it up and see. Um, where's our Haskell code? Um, we have, um, I guess, 600 lines of Haskell code here, um, which is doable, but uh, oh, actually there's, a, there's another little Haskell piece. Yeah, so probably a little over a thousand lines of Haskell code. Um, so it's getting kind of annoyingly uh, you know, large to just switch to OCaml on a whim. We actually have an OCaml extraction of, of it just as well for performance comparisons, and at least without doing any optimizations, they're both equally slow. And if you're willing to put in the optimizations, you can push both of them, and we chose to push only one of them forward. Um, turns out the performance optimizations you have to do are a little bit different. Uh, but yeah. Question. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's uh, the, the right. Uh, that, that's sort of sort of. Well, that's, that's our sort of way, way of. That's why we're working on this and not spending all of our time on C code. Uh, is because I think we're trying to do figure out how to do it at all. How to reason about crashes. Period. And I think uh, largely orthogonal question is how to generate performant uh, low level code. And we haven't really thought much. Well, haven't gotten anything particularly working yet in that space. All right, other questions about producing real code out of the system, how this fits in? Cool. All right, so let me now switch gears and talk about the uh, sort of final thing that we'd like you guys to build in this uh, set of assignments, and this is the replicated disk that is going to involve uh, trying to handle a failure of a disk at runtime. So someone smashes one of your disks with a hammer, and the system keeps going and actually also not losing your data in the process. So that was the sort of diagram for how we run stuff. I can just discard this board. Oh, there's more stuff here. Okay, so, so the system that we are planning to set up for you guys uh, that we'll hand out um, is um, a replication uh, implementation. It's uh, going to be called Replicate NBD. It's going to work in a very similar style as the diagram above, where uh, we sort of interpose on disk operations and uh, perform something kind of useful in the middle, except that instead of remapping a bed sector, we're going to be tolerating disk failures. So the plan is we're going to have two disks underneath of us, and we're going to be mirroring the contents of the, your data on both of these disks. So this is sort of the reality code level. And the spec, if you will, the abstraction that we're going to present to the world on top is going to be a single virtual disk. 
And the hope is that we're going to be able to present something that looks like a single real disk, and it's going to be more fault tolerant than either of the real disks at the bottom. So in order to be able to handle failures in this case, we have to be a little bit more precise about uh, what kinds of faults we want to tolerate and uh, what do we want to deal with. And our fault model, at least for the purposes of this lab assignment, um, is going to be that we can actually fail at any point. And what failure means is that so you're running along in the middle of any instruction that you're executing, one of the disks might just decide, I am dead. I'm not going to work anymore. I'm going to lose your data. And the sort of important part of this assumption is that um, what failure means is that actually a disk is going to report failure. So what this means is that um, you could imagine a disk where it fails and starts returning garbage to you. That's going to be kind of a harder problem to deal with because you have to check. The disk said the contents is 5. You don't know if that's true. You've got to go ask the other disk, do you think it's 5? And then if they disagree, which one is right? Who knows? We're going to have a simplified model where you can fail, but if a disk fails, it is going to tell you. If you go call read on a disk that's failed, it'll say, I failed. It's not going to lie. Similarly, if you go to write or write to a disk and it's, and it's failed, it will return an error from the write instead of succeeding. So the sort of extra constraints we're going to add on top of this um, is that we can have at most one failure. And this is kind of important, otherwise we'll not succeed. Uh, if both disks fail, there's not much we can do here. Make sense? Yeah, question back there. Uh, and the last assumption is no repair. So uh, once the disk fails, that's it. We're not going to bother trying to resuscitate a disk or plug in a real disk. Of course, these are all assumptions that in a real system you would sort of fix out, you would be able to repair this so the other one can fail later. Uh, but for the simplicity here, no repairs. Yeah. So uh, have you done things with models that are like more Byzantine? Um, Yes, yeah, so you have to write a fairly complicated implementation. So, for example, you have to use at least three disks then to do voting. Uh, and if they're particularly busy, yeah. yeah. In, the, in the only real end-to-end -end guarantee, you can get checking checksums on your own off of what you read off the disk. Um, so well, it depends. Like how Byzantine you get. Because the disk can also compute a checksum and give you a valid one. Right. Well, it depends how Byzantine you get, because the disk can also compute a checksum and give you a valid one for the bad data. Right. Yeah, well, it depends how Byzantine. It could be lying to you very carefully by constructing the wrong check, the, the correct section of the wrong data. Oh, so anyway, it depends on your failure mode, right? Like, yep. generally, it doesn't need to have a SHA-1 hash collision. It can just tell you here's the corrupted data and here's a correctly computed SHA check some of the corrupted data. It is a correct hash check. It doesn't need a collision. It's actually very easy to implement this fake disk. It just needs to be Byzantine. It, it might be just this is not a failure model you care about. This is basically a bug, fairly explicit bug in the disk controller as opposed to silent corruption of some bits on disk. So it depends. Um, I think as you progress to more adversarial looking disks, you end up, it's fairly easy to model them. It's just that the implementation gets trickier, and the reasoning about why that implementation is correct is also uh, trickier. Uh, but uh, the, the same rough uh, sort of skeleton or framework would work for reasoning about more complicated things as well. Yeah. Other questions? All right. So that's, uh, that's sort of the situation we're going to be reasoning with. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to add crashes to this, meaning that your computer can power off in the middle and have to restart and, and something will happen. But for now, uh, this is really a concurrency problem, because failing at any point, it's basically like there's someone running in parallel with your implementation. And at any point, they can run the opcode that kills a disk. <coughs> so you can really think of this as concurrency. Sense?
All right, so let's take a look at a little bit about uh, how we formalize this, and I'll sort of go back and forth between presenting you uh, code snippets from our framework and the code that you'll be implementing for the assignment, and drawing diagrams on the board, trying to explain what is going on and why we're implementing things a certain way. So the first things I want to uh, show to you guys is our model of the two disks at the bottom of that diagram. So this lives in two disk API. This looks a lot like the code you guys have already seen. So we have some uh, definitions about um, how you name disks. So there's two disks called D0 and D1. And we also have a notion of a disk result, which can either return something useful, a V, any kind of a type you can basically return, or you can say the disk failed. So this is kind of like an option type for reporting whether a disk failed or successfully returned you something. And now we're going to describe our state for the, for the code level. The state consists of two disks. These are the same kinds of disks you just saw in the remapped uh, lab for the last night's homework. And it's accompanied by this statement saying one of the disks is working. It basically says that if the first disk is none, it's gone. And the second disk also failed, it's none. Then that's false. That's just not possible. So this encodes our at most one failure assumption. And here's the operations you could run on this level. You can read a disk with a particular ID at an address and write and get the size. This is the same thing as the bad disk, except that you can also talk about a disk, either disk zero or disk one for all these opcodes. Make sense? Okay, and then we have some uh, helper machinery for allowing us to get a particular disk out of our state. This is just gonna help us write more succinct uh, theorems there and statements about our uh, logical state here. So let me fast forward to the definition of what is an allowed execution of all these three opcodes. Um, so here's what it says. Um, if you want to read, then you gotta see what's going on with that disk. If get disk returns sum, meaning the disk is there, hasn't failed, then you actually see what is at the requested address in the disk. If it's some address, meaning it's in bounds, then that is equal to the return value R. And if it's not in bounds, then the return value R is some random value. You don't, it's, the disk can return anything if you read past the end of the disk. But uh, if this get disk function up here returned none, meaning the disk is gone, it's failed, then the return value must be failed. So this encodes the disk reporting failure assumption uh, on the board there. And this is what defines a read opcode. And the same thing happens for the write. Basically, if the disk is there, you're gonna update it and return a, return a working response. And if the disk has failed, then you will return failure and inform the caller. Make sense? Hopefully, looks quite a bit similar. And now the interesting thing is, how do we mo model these background failures or the concurrent uh, possibility of a disk going bad? So we have a this BG failure relation that describes how you can uh, take a step between two states at the code level uh, without actually changing the program's execution. So while a program is executing, uh, according to the step relation we just saw at the top here, you're sort of taking a piece of the program, like a read opcode or a write opcode, you're consuming the read opcode and you're advancing the state. You're consuming the write opcode and changing the state accordingly. And these background steps can just happen in the background. They don't actually consume any part of the program. So wherever your program is, it can sort of stay there, but the state will evolve according to this BG failure relation. And the BG failure relation basically says, well, you could do nothing. You could just go from state to state, so nothing failed. Or you could fail the first disk or the second disk. And the way you do this is to say that the BG failure relation can go from a situation where you have two working disks, some D0 and some D1, to a state where disk D0 is gone, it's none, and only D1 remains, and symmetrically the same case for failing the other disk. Yeah? 
That's right, yeah. So the questions uh, you have, someone asked this morning, maybe you, about uh, whether it would be uh, easier to do an arbitrary number of bad sectors instead of just one bad sector. I think uh, it probably isn't actually easier in this particular case. Uh, so for bad sectors, uh, dealing with a list of bad sectors would be a little bit trickier than dealing with just one. And same thing here. You could, of course, encode an arbitrary number of disks and some kind of an assumption, like at most k out of n disks have failed. Um, it's all doable in Coq, uh, but it's, uh, I think, in this particular case, going to be more work to deal with that abstraction. And yeah, for, yeah, so this is absolutely why we're doing this for the class, because we think actually dealing with these two disks explicitly is a little bit simpler, but maybe Adam will set me straight. Well, this is not a follow-on. Oh. Where is the identifier of peak bound? Ah, yeah. So um, Adam uh, points out that there's this interesting thing going on here. So our disk state, so this is the state of the low-level world, consists of a, the, the two disks, and maybe one of them is gone, and a proof of the fact that at most one of them is gone. So this is the definition we saw at the very top here. Some disk works. And it's easy enough to construct the disks, but how the hell do you construct this prop thing? Uh, and what we do is we actually take advantage of, I think, fairly recent support in Coq to allow us to plug in an Altac thingy in the middle of a Galena expression that will basically, um, it's like a little LTAC proof that the LTAC engine runs at that point in the Galena expression to construct a proof of this fact. And this is what these lemmas actually help us achieve. I think that's uh, how it's working out. Okay, so can you explain this bit in a little more detail? I can explain it, although it's not super uh, relevant to the assignments, but uh, what's going on is that our state um, you can sort of think of it as the, these are dependent types here. Uh, so the state consists of the two disks and a proposition about those two disks, the fact that uh, you can't have both of them be missing. And um, one way you could, so it's easy enough to see how you would manipulate the disk zero and disk one. As we saw before, you just say none or some x. You could also manually construct this proof expression, but it would be a fairly messy thing to construct by hand. I don't know if you guys have sort of looked at what um, proof expressions look like, uh, but maybe let me, uh, okay, good. So you don't want to write down by hand. What uh, Coq allows you to do is in place of where you would explicitly spell out a proof expression, proof term, you can give an LTAC, so this proof thing uh, is, says LTAC, basically run this Sort of in, uh, almost as if you had a proof going on right there, and do this, apply this lemma or apply that lemma, and so on. So when Coq tries to build up this uh, Galena expression for set disk, when it needs to figure out what, is, what expression should be in place of that proof, it will run these LTAC operations, and if the LTAC succeeds, it will use the result of that LTAC to fill in the proof term. If the LTAC fails, it will refuse to define this definition. So we could, for example, make this proof tactic fail here. So it only tries to use one of the two lemmas. And you can see that now I cannot define this term anymore. I get an error saying no applicable tactic. It cannot find a tactic that fills in uh, a proof term that satisfies the type. So if I fix it again, I can actually print set disk, and you can see that it generates an expression for the proof term that is actually correct. So here, some disk works as d0 is some, and d1 is some, but I didn't have to type this out by hand. So it's a little bit of a digression on cock. Yeah, in general, Maybe the right advice is to avoid dependent types, but in this case, it seems quite important to state this fact. And uh, this simple, or simple enough dependent type can be handled without a particularly big mess. But this only works if the LTAC will resolve it. That's right. You have to fully, re well, there's two plans. Um, I guess might as well. You guys should learn about Coq. Um, so there's two plans, really. One is you could have LTAC that fully resolves it, like here. Or you could use the refine tactic, which maybe you guys have also already looked at, where you can build up a expression including proof expressions and proof terms in pieces, where you can put an underscore there, and Coq will give you a sub-goal to fill in that underscore, uh, and then you have to manually write LTAC things by hand instead of having a one-shot uh, tactic. Adam. 
That is true, yeah. So in this case, we could have done a different encoding that uh, syntactically almost prohibits the possibility of both disks failing. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> From the point of view of failure, an individual sector read and write is atomic. That's correct, yeah. 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 I don't want, uh, so um, only parsing, um, so as you can see, this is notation. Really, it's sort of like a macro. When you see proof, plug this in. When you, in general, define notation in Coq, it is used both to parse the things that you type in and Coq interprets and parses, and also, they're used to print stuff back to you. When you look at the proof context, Coq uses the notations you have defined to pr print things to you in a nice way. We don't particularly want Coq to uh, print the, the expression proof whenever it sees this strange bit of LTAC. <laughs> so all we want is this is a macro that Coq should use when parsing the characters I'm typing into the source code, but we don't want Coq to magically replace this result of that expression with the five characters proof when printing it back. That seems a little silly. Yeah? So, uh, so when would you use this technique when you wouldn't? Like, the, depends on the complexity of the soft key? The proof of this LTAC inlining technique? I don't know, whenever possible, or like otherwise I devoid of dependent types. Uh, I think. Yeah, if the invariant was much more complex, I'd rethink my approach here probably. Uh, do something like what Adam's suggesting, have constructors, or maybe put the, uh, this more complex fact maybe into the abstraction relation instead of putting it as a proposition into the state. And then I don't have to construct it when constructing a state. I sort of find it more convenient to decompose things into uh, computational things and states that actually go in the state pieces of our refinement diagram. And then all the facts sort of are mostly better suited to abstraction relations. And having dependently typed facts sometimes works out when they're simple and really important. Uh, but it's a trade-off. Um, Well, that's not an invariant, man. An invariant holds. <laughs> so for didactic reasons, you're not using uh, as much proof automation as you could be here. But that particular invariant falls in a well-known decidable theory, so you don't even need to write any automations for it. Uh, you don't need to write any proofs for it. You can just call on well, That's true, yeah. Man, yeah. That's, uh... <laughs> there could be many related invariants. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, yeah. OK. I don't think I could reproduce Adam. <laughs> okay, well, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so moving along to uh, where we had this background failure, so we can now model uh, a full API for our two disk system at the bottom here as um, basically a system that can take either these steps that execute the program or perform these background steps to model uh, disks failing in the background. All right, so that's the basis at the bottom uh, of our system. The other piece of machinery that I now have to present to you is a slightly different way of proving correctness of programs in this world. And, there, and this is basically going to be an alternative to the symbolic execution plan that we told you about yesterday. And the reason we're going to present to you something other than the symbolic execution you are perhaps so familiar with now is concurrency. The problem with concurrency is twofold. So concurrency uh, has two unfortunate uh, effects. First off, with concurrency, at every point in your execution, something else might happen, namely that BG failure relation. So if you use symbolic execution to reason about the concurrent execution of some code, you have actually a very large number of execution paths. And as a result, you will have many sub-goals to solve. So if you imagine you have a piece of code that's got five statements, well, uh, between every one of those five statements, you might take a BG failure. Maybe you take two BG failures. 
that's going to explode the number of sub-goals you're going to have to solve if you use the symbolic execution approach. The other problem that concurrency poses for us, or for the approach we presented yesterday, is that it makes it difficult to reason about state, because the state itself is going to change underneath of you. So with symbolic execution, maybe you arrive at a particular point in your execution where you know something is true about the state of your concrete disk, represented by a hypothesis in Koch. But shortly after that, you might hit a failure, and that fact will no longer be so useful because your state changed. So you will have to then probably consider cases, well, like, did something actually happen in the background, and do I have to now consider a different state and reason about it separately? So both of these reasons m explode the number of proof terms that you would get, sorry, the number of proof sub-goals that you would get, obligations, if you were to use the symbolic execution approach to prove the correctness of programs in this slightly concurrent setting. And the alternative plan that we're going to propose to you guys is a combination of two techniques. The first is that instead of using symbolic execution, we're going to use pre and post conditions. And what this means is that instead of rely, basically looking at these step relations and hypotheses and inverting them and saying, here's exactly what state you had before and here's exactly the state you have after, we're going to describe states using predicates. So perhaps you've already seen what a predicate is. So a predicate is just something that's going to take a state and return a proposition. So you can sort of think of it as, is this a good state or not? Does it satisfy a predicate or not? And the second part of the puzzle for how we're going to make these proofs go through is to use what we call stable predicates. So the, re the first step here is going to address the many execution paths problem. Instead of reasoning about all these many execution paths, we're going to cleverly construct pre and post conditions that capture the commonality between all these different execution paths. And then you can reason about it once instead of having to reason about each one individually. And these stable predicates are going to be things that actually don't change even though the state changes. So a stable predicate is something that is tr if it was true of a state before this background operation was going on, then it'll still be true afterwards across as many of these background failures as there could be. So this is going to allow us to have fairly succinct proofs uh, for this concurrent execution model. So let me give you an example of what I mean by all of this uh, in concrete code. So here's the implementation that we have for um, this. Well, let, let me uh, say a little bit more. So what I'm going to show you guys is a restatement of the specific of how the code uh, state evolves. So what I showed you before was a particular way of defining how executions happen at the lowest level of these two disks that can fail. And what we're going to do is restate them in terms of pre and post conditions using these stable predicates. And that's going to allow us to consider many fewer different execution paths because these pre and post conditions are going to collapse all the different failure cases into a single succinct description of what's going on. And the one trick we're going to use here is this uh, maybe holds relation that uh, you can probably already see on the screen here. So maybe holds is something that can take uh, one of these disks at the bottom and say, if it's there, then this must be true about it. So let me label the pieces of my diagram here. So here I have my two disks, D0 and D1, and here's my spec disk, S. So using maybe holds, the way we're going to write the abstraction relation between our two disks at the bottom and the logical replicated disk up top is by saying that, well, let's think about how you would write this. If you were naively to write this, well, you would say, well, it might be that 
this disk is there and it's equal to the spec disk, but this is gone. So that's one case. Another case is that this is gone, but this one is there and it's equal to S. Or both are there and they're both equal to the same S. So like three cases right there. And this will give you three sub-goals. The way we're going to write this using this maybe holds relation is to say that, well, if disk zero is there, then, and here's our sort of notation for maybe holds, it's this pipe equals operator with a question mark, you know, had to pick some symbols, uh, that must be equal to S. And in fact, this is a predicate, so instead of saying equal to S, we actually explicitly say EQS. So the way to read this is that D0 is something that might be there or might not be there. If, it might not, if it's not there, then you don't know anything. But if it is there, then it satisfies this predicate, and the predicate says it is equal to S. And the same thing is going to be true for the other predicate uh, about D1. It's also equal to S if it happens to be there at all. So this is a succinct way to describe the abstraction relation between our mirror disks and the spec disk, and it also happens to be stable. You can observe that if this was true before, and then one of these disks might have failed, this exact description is still true after this concurrent operation. So we can keep using this way of describing our state without having to now worry about what the heck is going on concurrently with us. Make sense? So here's a proof, in fact, on my screen of the fact that it is stable. It says that if the state uh, disk zero satisfies some predicate F zero and the other disk satisfies F one, then after a failure in the new state, these are still true. And it turns out this one's actually fairly straightforward to prove. I'm not even going to bother showing the proof steps. And uh, we can then uh, state theorems of this form about our primitive operations. So we can say that here's a different way of describing what it means to run the read opcode instead of using the step relation we saw earlier. We say that the precondition must be that disk zero is equal to some hypothetical disk D underscore zero, and the other disk has some relation that holds on it, some predicate. And afterwards, in the post condition, either the disk zero worked and returns a state where all the same things are true about our world, and the result value v is what is at disk zero that address, or we return failed and disk zero must be missing now. We actually learn this fact in the post condition that disk zero might have, must have failed in the meantime if we get a failed opcode. Make sense? So this is a way of restating basically the behavior of our operations. For now, let's ignore the recovery. We'll talk about that much more tomorrow. So the thing I want to show you guys now is how we use these restated pre-post condition specifications in proving the correctness of our replicated disk implementation. So here is, uh, for example, the implementation of our uh, replicated disk. Let me pop up Coq ID in a uh, better way. Uh, there's a way to, I think, detach this guy, and I can use more screen space. So. What's going on is that uh, here we have an implementation of the replicated read. What it does is reads the first disk. If it got a response, then it returns the value. If it failed, then read the other disk. If that one worked, good. Otherwise, we failed and we return all zeros, but that shouldn't be possible because we'll prove that's, that's the fact later. So how do we prove the correctness of something like this read? So let me step down to uh, where we state this read OK theorem. So here's a theorem about read. It says that if the precondition was your two disks were both satisfying this predicate that I draw on the board, they're all equal to some logical spec disk D, then in the post condition, that is still true about your new state. And also the return value R is equal to the contents of this logical disk at that address if it has such an address at all. So it sort of concisely deals with the possibility of out-of-bounds reads as well. So how do you make this proof go through? Well, it turns out we can automate this a huge amount. So 
here's how you deal with these proofs. It's kind of like symbolic execution, except that you use these predicates instead of literal states. So here, we are proving the correctness of this program, which is the inlined definition of read. Use the step tactic to basically do one step of effectively symbolic execution or whore logic reasoning. And what it does is it sort of looks for the pre and post conditions of this read opcode and matches them up with the precondition you currently have. So after a step, you're going to be left with uh, a specification about the rest of your program because it sort of did the read symbolically, if you will. And now you can reason about the read. But there's two cases here. The read that you just stepped over might have succeeded or failed, so you destruct it. You get your two cases whether the read succeeded or failed. In both cases, if you scroll down to the proof state, you're now reasoning about the remaining program on that branch of the if statement. And you can use the step tactic to also uh, prove that fact. So all your proofs kind of look like just calling step and destructing things and considering all these cases. So this is the other case where the first read failed now from the destruct. And you can see that the remaining program is the read of the other disk filled, filed by, followed by another match. And you can actually just keep going, destruct, step, step, and that's it. You've proven the correctness of read. So this whole pre-post condition plan leads to much nicer proofs, as hopefully you will see in the assignments. Um, your job for the assignment is going to be to implement the right opcode for the replicated disk, which we did not provide for you. Shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, but the interesting thing is going to be trying to implement the right OK proof in a similar whore logic -y style. Uh, we didn't fill in the post condition for you here. You can sort of try to fill that in and see how it goes. Uh, you can ignore the recovery condition for today. And your job is going to be to make this proof go through. And then we actually wrote a little program for you that'll check whether you got it all right. So here's the program, uh, this write read check. It writes some data to a particular address and then reads it back and then returns what it read back. And the theorem that you have to prove is that write read check always returns what you wrote. So it better be the case that your program correctly writes stuff to disk that it can read back in the presence of failure. So maybe you wrote it to one disk, that disk failed, you better be able to read it out of the other disk and return the same value. So that's, gonna, that's your assignment for, uh, I guess, the homework for this afternoon. Try to prove that. Uh, if you get done, come find us. We actually have a little bit of an extra follow-on assignment for you, trying to prove the correctness of the initialization code, which turns out to be quite important for this replicated case. You can look for in it uh, at OK. This is a, another proof that you can try to fill in uh, if you're looking for more stuff to do. But anyway, uh, we'll be around this afternoon if you have questions or come find us right after this lecture, but I should let you go. Thanks. <laughs>